you know, the more events we can have and the more participation we can have in them. We also look forward, throughout the year, we go to different churches, different synagogues. Uh, recently, we went to uh, an event in Southern Maryland where they, a church was hosting a Save Our Fort. And uh, they were raising money for solar cookers, which are a type of cooking device for refugees in that fort. And we, we really got to learn a lot. We, we, we saw an aspect that isn't necessarily about the details of religion, but it's about the values of humanity. Is helping each other out, is working together for a common goal. And that goal is to save the world, you know, from the terrible things that, you know, people can sometimes do. So once we work together, you know, I think great things can happen. Thank you. I think when we go without food, or we go without something that we normally consume, 
we realise how dependent we are on our surface feelings or on our surface desires, our immediate wants. And when we, in a disciplined way, um, go without those, I think it enables us to think a little more deeply about our life and more deeply about ourselves. And I certainly have experienced this when I, whenever I've fasted, I've become more aware of my need to change, more aware, of, more aware of my need to be a better person, and more aware of my need for God to help me be a better person. So I think through this time, uh, we can become more aware of our need to change, and that's a, that's a healthy, positive thing. The other thing that I think we can reflect on at a, at a time like this is um, perhaps uh, following the, in the teaching of one of the ancient Hebrew prophets, Isaiah, who, speaking on behalf of God, said, it's not the fast that I have chosen to release the oppressed and to give food to the hungry. In other words, I think when we, um, when we go without something, it makes us more aware of the needs that other people have. So perhaps the first thing was reflecting internally about our need to change, but it also makes us more aware externally of other people, and particularly the, the poor and oppressed. And, you know, I've, I've been very encouraged and um, in my conversations with Imam Nakfi about this community here and how much you care about what is going on around the world and even in the, in the community around us and how perhaps we can serve together to help people who are in need. And I think that's a rich part of all of our traditions that we need to preserve at all costs, that we would make the world a better place by um, being aware of other people's needs. The other thing I think that it does, that's the third thing, um, is it makes us aware of our weakness, of our frailty, of our humanity. Not in a negative sense, but I think just being hungry, and many of you have probably experienced hunger over the past few days. I know um, when I fast, um, sometimes that hunger can feel intolerable at times, and you can feel physically weak from that hunger. But I think that can um, remind us of the fact that we're just human beings. And that can lead us to become more humble. And I think humility leads us to accept other people. When we recognize our own frailty, our own weakness, our own imperfection, that we don't have everything right. Not no one of us has a monopoly on what's right or on, on the truth. We become more accepting and more tolerant of other people. And I think that's something that, again, is a, a rich tradition, uh, or a rich heritage in, in each of our traditions that we would love and accept other people. And we, if, we, if we're, we know that we're weak people, if we know that we're just normal, frail people, how could we um, be intolerant or unaccepting of others when we recognize what we ourselves are like? And I think at this time particularly, when there's so much division in the world, and then it seems that there's so much hatred, and sometimes, ironically and tragically, it seems that religion can even contribute to that division and contribute to that hatred. At this time particularly, I think we together can set a great example of love and acceptance and forgiveness and tolerance to one another. And I wanted to thank, well, I would like to thank Imam Nakhli particularly um, for being courageous enough to reach out to people like me uh, who come from different traditions and, and accepting me so warmly and, 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 and so with such friendship. And I hope that um, this can be something that grows and grows in the future, that we will see more of this happening, so that we might be able to set an example um, of peace and kindness that could bring great freedom to the world. And that would be a wonderful if, if thing if, if it were to happen. Thank you very much for listening to me, and peace to you. Thank you.
um, than just you know going to McDonald's or you know going to these places that we're we're so used to sort of spending our, our money. Um, this month and, and, and all of Islam is meant to teach mankind to control their animal instincts and to opt for a more ethical behavior and control of ourselves and, and desires in exchange for being closer to Allah or, or God, the Almighty. Fasting and daily prayers are not just rituals that we perform, but we must understand what is the point of doing it, just like Pastor Dreyer was sharing with us some of the three possible experiences that you have during fasting. The Holy Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, has said that Allah does not accept the prayer of that servant of whose heart is not present along with his body. Only the part of your prayers that you are paying attention is worth anything. If you don't concentrate during your prayer and truly understand what you say, then you're just passing time, and this is not a prayer. So this is the time, brothers and sisters, in the holy month of Ramadan to evaluate ourselves and evaluate the internal and to judge ourselves before it's too late what kind of human being we really are and what's, Im what's important to us. And to really understand what our prayers mean and to perfect them in this holy month. I'd like to introduce our next guest for the evening, Mr. Ed Stern from the Bethesda Jewish Congregation. Ed Stern has been studying his religion, uh, Judaism, and other religions of the East and West since he studied comparative religion in his 10th grade uh, Sunday school classes about 50 years ago. His interest led him to, I didn't, I didn't make that up, he wrote it here for me. <laughs> His interest led him to teach religious school classes for high school students who raised many insightful questions. And he began hosting adult classes in Jewish law, philosophy, and history at the Bethesda Jewish Congregation 15 years ago. By training, Mr. Ed Stern is an econ economist. He found that studying Talmud, Jewish philosophy, particularly Spinoza and Ma Maimon Maimonides, okay, was good preparation for his work developing intelligent systems. I had practiced that, I swear, over and over, and I, I messed it up. But uh, he's here to share with us some thought-provoking questions, and I welcome him. Please help me to welcome Mr. Edstrom. Shalom Aleichem. I bet that sounds very familiar. <laughs> I thought you would understand. Uh, and I thank you for the invitation. It's, it's, a, it's a fine thing to be uh, hospitable, which you, this congregation is. And I see in the Hadith that it's also an obligation of a Muslim to accept an invitation. And uh, this is from this collection of hadith. Hadith uh, for my Jewish and Christian friends who may not realize are sayings of, of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Uh, so you've invited and, and we have uh, followed the command of accepting invitations and we're very happy to have that opportunity. Uh, I particularly uh, want to mention that the, the pastor's remarks looking at both the uh, Christian and, and Jewish perspective, reaching back to Isaiah, are very interesting. And you can find further discussion on that in the uh, letters and instructions from Imam Ali on page uh, 542, as he explains how to take care of the, the uh, poor and the destitute. Uh, so, Again, there's an area in which we have common interests and, and uh, pretty much complete agreement. Um, and then let me really read you one line from this. It says, Fear Allah and keep Allah in view and respect of the lowest class consisting of those who have few means, the poor, the destitute, the penniless, and the disabled. Because in this class are both the discontented and those who beg. Take care, 
for the sake of Allah of his obligation towards them for which he has made you responsible. This is teaching of your teacher. It's also the teaching teachings of our teachers. Uh, I wanted to share an, another hadith which struck me as something closely related to an idea in the, in the uh, Hebrew Bible. Um, it's, it's, it's analogous and I wanted to raise it with you because I have a question for you on this. Let me uh, try and read it and I'll, I'll tell you <coughs> where we come out on this. And this is from uh, Al Nawawi's 40 Traditions of the uh, 26, from Abu Huraira, with whom may Allah be pleased, who said, The Messenger of Allah, may benediction and salutation of Allah be upon him. <clears throat> the charity is due each day that the sun rises on every bone of finger of all the people. If you settle a quarrel between two individuals, literally, if you do justice between two people, <clears throat> that is a charity. If you help a man with his beast, mounting him thereon, or lifting up onto it his baggage, that is a charity. A good word is a charity. In every step you take, while walking to prayers, there is a charity. Wherever you remove something harmful from the path, that is a charity. Wherever you remove something harmful from the path, that is a charity. And it says Al Bukhari and Muslim related it. This is uh, for the Jews and Christians here. This is authentication that this this hadith is also quoted by the most eminent collectors of hadith. And what struck me with this teaching that it's a charity to remove something harmful from the path is it seemed analogous to the Jewish uh, teaching in the Hebrew Bible from Leviticus 19.14. It says, you shall not put a stumbling block before the blind. And it's interesting uh, you know, this is very old material. The Jews have been commenting, uh, writing on this for 2,000 years after it was written. And some thought, when they saw it, that it shouldn't be taken literally, that is to, just as it means, because of course you shouldn't put a stumbling block before the blind. Everybody knows that. So you don't have to say it. And for that reason, you don't even have to consider literal meaning at all. It's taken to be you should focus on the figurative meaning. But the rabbis debated this in the Talmud and then later in commentaries over the last 2,000 years. And they said, well, it has both a literal meaning and a figurative meaning. And the figurative meaning, uh, as the way we're reading this, is that you should not do anything in business or personal relationships that leads someone into a misunderstanding, leave them into error, because you put something there in front of them that they don't know. In effect, you are putting an obstacle on the path, you're putting something harmful in their way. And I personally had the experience of working on a federal regulation to protect public, uh, protect workers from hazardous chemicals, and I told the political leadership when we were finished on this that to me, the fact that we were telling employers that they had to tell employees about the nature of the hazardous chemicals that they were dealing with, when many people were dealing with things, and they had no idea that these things could, could poison them. Uh, you know when acid burns you, you know that. But if something is going to uh, you know, hurt you internally, you may not know. So in this way, by adopting this new rule that we were preventing people from putting a stumbling block before the blind. Anyway, there are so many things that we could discuss, can't go on, but I would like to know uh, when one of the scholars here gets a chance, 
does Islam look at this teaching of you shall it's a charity to remove a, a harmful thing from the path, view that only literally, or do you also see it as a statement of general principle? Anyway, I'm very glad to come and celebrate with you all, and uh, this is a, a very fine event. So I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Stern. And to answer your question, yes, there are many instances in, in Islam where things are not taken literally, but they're figurative and, and they're metaphors for, for real life, such as not to put a stumbling block in, in a blind person's path. Absolutely, I mean, it makes a lot of sense that perhaps there's somebody who's blind to religion and you don't want to mislead them about things and it makes it di more difficult for them to understand, but you want to help them instead of putting obstacles in the way. And one of the best ways we can help people into becoming better people and, and, and to, to overcome these sort of obstacles is by being a good um, kind of person ourselves and, and giving them some a, a role model or whatnot to look up to. And each of you here are role models to the people immediately around you. And, and if you're political figures, then, then your constituency and your, your children and your parents even. So it's important and it's something to remember in this month, especially this month of Ramadan, to be a good person, to be a good, leave a good impression on people and to remove kind of that obstacle from, you know, coming and understanding God in essence and, in, and being a part of religion. Our, our next guest is Mr. Reverend Hey, uh, Grayland Scott Hagler from the Plymouth Congregational United Church of Christ in Washington, D.C. He has a Master's in Divinity from Chicago Theological Seminary uh, in 1980, and in 1992 he became Senior Minister at the Plymouth Congregational United Church of Christ and has taken on many initiatives such as uh, preventing the building of a Super Exxon gas station on Riggs Road and North Capitol Street and replacing it instead with a plan for a senior residential center, uh, blocking the issuance of a liquor license to a neighborhood grocery store, and organizing protests to close a drug-infested nightclub. Reverend, Reverend Hagler is running to serve as a DC council member for Ward 4, and the theme of his campaign is neighborhoods that work, neighbor, that, thr that thrive, that are great places to live. Please help me welcome Mr. Reverend Hagler. Good evening, and thank you for the invitation to be here with you this evening. Uh, I'm sorry that I was not here earlier. There was a, a prayer vigil that was taking place in Lafayette Park that I had agreed to speak and uh, preach at. And that prayer vigil was over uh, a, a case uh, that uh, continues in the United States called uh, the case of the Cuban Five. And some of you may have seen glimmers of that. Uh, and it really uh, points up the contradictions that we often deal with in our political life. Because here uh, you have uh, a guy by the name of Carillos, uh, Pasado Carillos, who uh, basically blew up an airliner, a Cuban airliner in 1976, with the aid of the U.S. government. Uh, and today is living and walking around in Miami free, though countries have asked for his extradition uh, to those countries, particularly Venezuela has asked for his extradition. extradition. But the issue behind that type of contradiction is, is that here we're talking about a war on terrorism, and the fact is, is that you have an international terrorist walking around free in Miami that the whole world knows has killed innocent people on an airliner. So we participated tonight in that vigil to keep that before the public. So uh, again, I continue to ask for your prayers as we continue to stand for issues of justice and for issues uh, that uh, are filled with principle and does and points out the hypocrisy that sometimes we deal in as a nation.
as we talk about this issue of fasting, you know, there's some words that come to my mind. And words that come to my mind are words like arrogance, words like pride, words like selfishness, words like being self-centered, which is a terrible sin. Because when we engage in fasting, we remind ourselves in some real ways that very often day to day in this world, in America particularly, we engage in a frivolous lifestyle by and large that is captive by material things, that is captive by automobiles and very often the fancy clothes that we can wear on our backs and things that, when we, that we really cannot take with us when we leave this world. But we, but we base so much of our identity on these things that we have, on these cars that we drive, that, that somehow we end up seeing ourselves as being set apart because of what we've been able to accumulate in this world, that somehow we're better than someone else and, 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 and more sophisticated or superior than someone else. But the fact is, is when we come down and really participate in a discipline of fasting, we realize that it doesn't matter what we have, that we're all vulnerable before God. We're all dependent on God giving us life and sustaining us. So, so in, 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 in fasting, all of the phony pride is stripped away. All, all of the arrogance that we have is stripped away. All of the self-centeredness that we carry in ourselves is, is stripped away. And we find out that the fact is, is that if it was not for the grace of God, we would not be here. If it wasn't for the grace of God, we would not be given the gift of another moment, another second, another day. Fasting, it reminds us of our vulnerability. Because very often, as you know, in this world, we end up being detached very often from other human beings. Being detached from the struggles that other people face. Being detached and, and it can so easily intellectualize any kind of injustice as long as it doesn't affect us. But when we come face to face with the fact that we're only allowed this gift called life by the grace of God then we understand that we are no different than the person next door or down the street or around the world who is struggling and going through suffering and going through pain. And we recognize that we are linked by the Divine One. The Divine One is the one that actually reminds us that we are one, that we are one. You see, when, when I always say this to my congregation, and I got folks sometimes that don't agree with me, but I always remind us that when we get into paradise, we're going to find out there's not only Christians there, but there's Muslims there, and there's Jews that are going to be there, and, 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 and there's going to be people that we don't even understand their religious ways, they're going to be there. Right? Uh, and, and, and it reminds us the fact is, is, that, is that we cannot figure out or understand the ways of the Holy One. <clears throat> but we can submit ourselves to the will of God. And the will of God reminds us that we are linked to one another. <coughs> it reminds of us our dependence upon God. It reminds us of a want and need that exists in this world. Now the Christian tradition mostly places its emphasis in fasting during the time of Lent. Right, that, that, that 40 that, that, that 40 that 40 day season. But one thing that is in a black Christian tradition is that when something is going on, it doesn't matter whether it's Lent or it doesn't matter what other time of year it is, you hear people say, you know, we've got to fast and we've got to pray about it. If somebody's ill, we've got to fast and, and pray about it. It's not just something that is reserved at a particular time on the liturgical calendar in the black tradition, but it's something that we internalize in, 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 in our active uh, 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 relationship with God to really, in a sense, summon the power of God to intervene into the situation. So people will always talk about it's time to fast 
and pray when somebody's sick. It's time to fast and pray when someone's going through something. But also we are reminded that this whole idea of fasting and praying, I, I remember the words of Jesus that reminds folk. It says that when you're fasting, don't walk around looking all gaunt so that everybody can see that you're fasting because then we can easily take our fasting as a thing of pride. Right? So, to let folks know exactly how holy we are. See, we're fasting. <laughs> uh, but, 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 but fasting should be about teaching us humility. Teaching us about our relationship with one another, with each other. And most of all, we're also reminded that fasting is not just the absence of food, but it's understanding the will of God enough to bring about the presence of justice in the world. Yeah. To stand for justice, no matter what the politicians have to say, no matter what the political pundits have to say, to stand for justice. How, how do you know what is justice? Well, if somebody is being denied the dignity of life, that's who I stand with because that's my sister and that's my brother. And we really got to begin to strip away all of the pretense we have and, and learn how to come together and deal with that equation called justice. And when I say justice, you know, we need to have justice in places like Cuba. We need to have justice in places like Palestine. We need to have justice in places like Africa. We need to have justice all over this world. And what is justice? But it's coming together and learning that if we don't learn to exist as brothers and sisters, we will surely perish as fools. That's what justice is. Justice is not, a violent, is not a violent equation. Justice is an equation of love. And it's an equation of respect for one another. So when we fast, we realize our humanity. And we realize that though we may not share in DNA, the fact is we are related. And some folks may not want to admit our relationship to each other. But I got news for you, come that day, God's going to remind us of our relationship. God bless you. Rabbi Ashrah Ali Sadri, Vajasir Liyami, 
This is the famous dua of Prophet Moses in the Quran. And I'd like to translate to all of you when we have people from all denominations here. Oh Allah, expand my chest. Make my job easier, my task easier. Open the tongue tie so that, so that I can communicate with my congregation so that they understand me better. It is a distinct pleasure and honor for me to welcome all the rabbis, the priests, the pastors, the distinguished guests, this center that we are all sitting, we signed the land papers in 1979. Incidentally, I came to this country as a physician in 1971, being trained all over, and finally started practice in 1975 in the local area, and I'm a practice urologist. I'm not soliciting by saying that I'm real in the local area. <laughs> the center opens the door in 1996. And what could be a better use of this place than on the evening of the fasting of Ramadan? That the children of Prophet Abraham are all gathered together here including Christian Jews and Muslims, sharing their old traditions and their closeness and wrongness to each other. Marana Nakuri, who is the Imam of this mosque for the last so many years, has done, done a tremendous groundwork to bring these, all these communities together. The good news I want to give you all is a political news, but on October the 2nd, the U.S. Congress made a resolution to be the month of Ramadan as an official month in the United States for the recognition of Muslims not in the United States, but also all over the world. The relations between our communities are not of today's or the centuries. They have been there from the very beginning. This is not the first time that Muslims are living in Christian lands. When uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam started <laughs> his ministry and the things got harder for the local Muslims, Prophet Muhammad sent a group of Muslims to live in Ethiopia, which was a Christian land at that time. And they were instructed to follow the tradition and the discipline of the land that they were going to live in. And they lived for several years in harmony and peace in Ethiopia. The second very important and memorable moment that we have uh, with the Jews is that after the in the mosque when Imam Ali was injured and was taken back home, uh, to his home, a group of advisors, the physician advisors, were brought in, and one of them was a prominent Jew physician who was an expert on poisons who gave his information, his input regarding the expectancy and life expectancy, expectancy of Rasulullah, of, of Imam Ali. I'm pointing out all these things that these traditions of cooperation, understanding and friendship have been long lasting and been there over the years. Temporary setbacks which we see should be removed and she all should live in harmony and peace in the world. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Dr. Shaw. Someone asked Imam Ali, alayhi salam, peace be upon him. How can we know if our fasting is accepted by God? Imam Ali said, evaluate yourself from the previous year of fasting. Have you changed any? If you have improved yourself, then your fasting is accepted. And next year, again, if you improve yourself from this year, then your fasting is accepted. But if there is no change, and you have not become a better person, then what is the point of your fasting? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God, doesn't need us to fast for Him. The fasting is prescribed for our benefit. The month is not over yet. We still have time to take a moment and look within ourselves and to address those things that make us not better people. Some of the things um, Reverend Hagler mentioned, arrogance, selfishness, and, and pride. These things that make our souls heavy and keep us from perfect, perfecting ourselves perfecting the soul that God has created, that has the ability to become perfect, but we just have to work on it. And this is the month to do that. Well, I'd like to go ahead and now introduce you to Hujatul uh, Islam Sayyid Nabawi. He is a leader in the community, the chairman of the Board of Scholars and the Islamic Information Center. Please help me to welcome Hujatul Islam Sayyid Nabawi Salawat. In the name of that, the most beneficent and merciful, ladies and gentlemen, Shalom Alaikum, peace be upon you, and Salam Alaikum. I said in the order, right? Because Moses came, and then Jesus, and then Prophet Muhammad, or peace be upon one of them. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege and honor to welcome all of you, and also thank you for joining us, and supporting us, and uh, giving us motivation to come together and have these kinds of discussions and this is I think the third year or fourth year that we are having this uh, <clears throat> program that's sharing the blessings of Ramadan. As you've heard from our uh, respected scholars that uh, the institution of fasting is a very important institution for the human race. And uh, the boy who has just read some of the verses from the Quran, and he read three verses. And very briefly, I'm going to talk about that, and that proves everything that we are here tonight. The very first verse that he read it says that if someone who is a believer, and he and she does good deeds. Whether he and she is from a Jew, or from a Christian, or from Syrians, and these names are just for example, or from any other belief, and they have their belief in the God Almighty and the day of resurrection, there is no fear for them, and they will get their reward from God, that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which makes things very clear. That whether they are from the Jewish descent or from Christian descent, or if they are a believer, and they are a believer in Allah, that they are a believer in the day of resurrection, the last day, then they, their reward is safe. And they will be given the reward 
my dear master. The second verse that the boy that he has read is about the about the fasting. And the straight meaning is this that for believers God has prescribed fast upon you. He has written fast on you as he has done to the communities before you, meaning communities before Prophet Muhammad. And those communities were the communities of Jesus, the communities of Moses, or just go to Abraham and all those prophets. So Quran is very, very explicit. And Quran is saying that, O oh, Muslims, Allah has prescribed fast on you in the same manner the same God has done and prescribed for Christians, for Jews, and those, the other believers. It means that, that we have the same origin. Whether we, we, have, we are descending from Judaism or from Christianity or from Islam, it goes back to one common point. And that is, when we go back to Abraham, if you go through Ishmael, or you go through Isaac, you have to come anyway through this way or that way to Prophet Muhammad, and this is the community of Prophet Muhammad. So the ayah is very, very clear, the verse is very, very clear that that all Muslims do not be surprised that if God is making these fasts obligatory on you, this is nothing new. The community before you, they also be asked to fast. And the third one that again, because we call God with different names, and the third verse that he has read was talking about, and God is saying, doesn't matter. You call Allah, or you call the merciful. Rahman, or you take any other name. All the names of Allah, they are majestic names. It's not going to make any difference if you are, and it is Allah and God only that He is not in need of any name. Everybody, every existence in this universe needs some, some uh, uh, introduction and some name, except God, the God, and He is not in need of any name, and that is why some of the places in Hadith and in the Quran, the word that is being used for Him is who, who, that means He. Now He is the God. Now there is no name for that God. So it depends that who is calling His He, whatever it is, that is His God. So that is the ayah saying that doesn't matter all creation, all human beings, doesn't matter. You say Allah, you say the God, you say any other name you take it, that's okay. As far as you're calling your master and your creator, that creator is going to accept that name from you because all the beautiful names are majestic for Allah and for God. So it means. Ladies and gentlemen, these kind of meetings are very much needed today because something that is playing a very bad role is something which is known as fear of unknown. That is going on here today in the servants of God from different denominations. Because I don't know you, so I'm afraid of you. Because you don't know me, that's why you're afraid of me. And if you come close, then this fear of unknown will be gone. And once the fear of unknown is gone, then we, are, we will become known to each other. And then there will be no fear. And if there will be no fear, there will be no hatred. There will be no hatred, then of course, then the love and compassion will take the place of that hatred and of that uh, like, the difference, difference that we have in the humanity. So, this is a very informal type meeting.
was not a formal seminar or there was nothing. So you can see the arrangement. There was not a dial, so there was not a page from things like that, just a podium and speakers, they are sitting in front row. So it was just a friendly uh, type of meeting. So we had, and now I think that we should have meetings like this in future as we are working very closely with BJC and with uh, Gary, that is his, our point man of contact, and with Pastor Matthew, that uh, I have uh, a lot of appreciation for him. I just met him once and then we just got on the phone that he is very near and dear to me. And today, with the blessing of this thing, we became close to Pastor Hagler, that we heard very much of his name in DC, but today we got a chance to meet him and may God bless him, and may God bless all of you who are present here this night. Again, I thank you very much, all of you, may God bless you. And now, you know that in Islam, and I'm sure that in all of the English and Christianity, there is a practice that after the service, after the worship, and this is the worship that we are doing, that's no, nothing uh, different than worship, that we are here for this now, that we are here, what we have a practice that after we are done with the worship, we hug each other and we embrace each other, we shake hands each other to congratulate that may God accept your sincere endeavors because you have taken your time, you have come here. I want you also, ladies and gentlemen, that we should do this practice and after I'm done uh, from this, I'm gone from this podium, I think still there is time, you can uh, go and talk to each other, meet each other, know each other, so this fear of unknown should go. May God bless you and salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa website at islaminginformationcenter.org but the challenge is to fast on Monday for justice and, and everybody's going to be participating in this and you should as well especially given all the wonderful fasting messages today it would be it would be crazy not to uh, well we, we, as you can tell we've come to the end of our program and I, I, I personally hope that you've enjoyed the experience here tonight um, and, and to Go away from this and, and to take good things with you and to, to, to be more active in your communities, to, to work for justice, to be better people, better individuals, and to be good examples for the people around us, our children, our parents, our friends, members of our communities, and to remove those obstacles from people's ways, to fast, and to give charity. I want to thank again Jesuit Islam State Nabawi and our distinguished guests, Pastor Drop Dyer, uh, Mr. Ed Stern, Reverend Pegler, and Dr. Pavi Shaw, and your respective communities. I know members of all your communities are here with us tonight to share in this moment, and I want to encourage you to, to do what um, Sayyid Nabawi was saying and to get to know your neighbors and to share your thoughts and ideas and questions and to get rid of the you know, the barrier of the unknown. And again, many thanks to the Dari Jafaria and their volunteers, their tireless and continued support and for their facilities this evening. And once again, on behalf of uh, the Islamic Information Center, I thank you. And if I could ask all the speakers to come up for a picture opportunity. <laughs> Appreciate it. All right, Salwan.